Okay, so good morning, everyone. Uh, so it's a most great pleasure and a great honor to be part of this conference. I'm very pleased to celebrate uh, Asa's birthday. And so uh, while preparing this talk, I decided to go back uh, a bit in history. So this week some rather old stuff and okay, more recent work we did together about this technique called contract organization. Okay, so in a, in, in a few words, this is one more acronym that uh, we should work really with. So this, this was named for uh, by the, the founder of the technique of contract organization. It's a very systematic technique to derive um, effective model for strong integrated systems. And the main advantage, I think, is it, in a sense, it's trying to implement the catalog with some uh, real space RV IDs, but in the space of Hamiltonian. So we are only dealing with Hamiltonian in the sense it's, I will show it's not the alternative way to derive a simpler, a simpler effective model. It's rather generic, it should produce a low energy physics. So this is what we are aiming at when doing condensed model theory. The key that, uh, that you will see maybe in some of the examples is that the effective model may not be always simpler. So this is of course, but this is a case by case study. And uh, so we, we are familiar with this idea put forward in this famous quote by Anderson, maybe make it more is different, that indeed we have many emergent degrees of freedom as we heard in the previous talks. And so it, 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 it makes no sense trying to we start from a microscopic, ultimately fundamental uh, model. Uh, at some point, when we are looking at a given energy scale, like you can see on this, I think it was the I think from uh, Asa's talk uh, on this topic some years ago. When you look at a given energy scale, you should use the relevant degree of freedom, which makes sense. And uh, how, how can we do that? So we, we want ultimately, especially in strongly correlated systems where we are competing phases, we had yesterday, but I'm by Steve Pigonson. Also, this is a magnetic session, so I will mention the Kagome issue at the end. We have many competing phases that low energy, so we need uh, essentially to focus on this low energy subspace and try to, to, uh, to understand this competition. So, you can do numerics. I mean, part of my, part of my time, I do that. But we know that those for simulation is very hard. Uh, not always going to work because we are facing a, a very uh, hard wall, and we know that brick wall or stone wall can last for a long time. Here, and is it okay? You can you can try, of course. But what I will try to argue is that uh, numerics can be used precisely only to derive this effective model, and then the effective model you can study by other techniques, or you can use it, or even do numerics. But uh, I will show that numerics can be useful in this way. Okay, so the outline will be to present to you the, the technique, this contractor organization, and then show you some applications to, to the systems, mostly some mod insulators and the dot mod insulators for IPC materials. And uh, so it's a long, I mean, as I said, it's some historical talk, so there has uh, been a lot, lot of collaboration. So I'm from Toulouse, so many people in the Toulouse room, Fabien Allé, Mathieu Mombri, Didier Paul Blanc. Then uh, people in Stanford, in fact, uh, I will tell you about the story, but so I was visiting Shen Gong and the students, and we had also a discussion with Marvin Weinstein, founder of, the, of this technique in the, in the Nagel lab. And of course, so the, the encounter with ASA and, and some major sort of also, and many other people that I will mention maybe some record. So as I said, it, it all started with a, as often in physics, with some encounter. So I was lucky enough to visit Stanford like 15 years ago maybe. And so I was wondering what are these people doing in Stanford? Okay, it's a very nice campus. So yeah. okay, in fact, okay, it's sunny, etc. But people are thinking most of the time everywhere, right? You can see thinkers all over the campus. <laughs> in reality it was more like this. This was my opinion. So it's still sunny, but okay, it looks more like a normal office. And so I had the chance to to meet Asa. I think he was sitting maybe when he was taking a picture, I don't know. And uh, he told me about a paper uh, and the discussion he had, had with uh, a guy at 
the stack, neighboring lab. And so it was, uh, so Weinstein and Morningstar, they, had, they, they were high energy physicists trying to do lattice gauge theory at finite fermion density, which is a hard problem too. And they came up with a very nice idea to, I mean, you can read from the abstract, maybe it's a real space energy technique. But in this first paper, it's very difficult to implement because what they call a contractor is simply this imaginary time propagation that we don't project in the state of ground state. I mean, we often do that, often comments matter. But the formula for the renormalized Hamiltonian is horrible, you know? How can we compute this object? But fortunately, they have done all the hard work in a later, you know, later paper. So in 96, they had this second paper. And there, they provide a simple recipe that I will describe, but as you can also read from the abstract, they show its effectiveness using scalar field theory or Eisenberg change. So essentially, you can do any that theory you like. And indeed, it was published in Fizrel. So what is the recipe? <coughs> if you take a square lattice that I will use in, in part of my talk, if you take a square lattice, you can divide it in packets. And on each packet, you will uh, diagonalize your model and uh, only keep a certain number of low lying states. And then the goal is to find the effective interaction between these states. They will be local, so they will include one packet interaction, two packets, three packets, etc. And so you need to use the numerics to compute this uh, interaction. I don't, I don't want to bother you with the detail, but because it's a, based on the link cluster theorem, etc., you know that you need to subtract the subcluster contribution when you do that. And at the end of the day, you can you, you, you will get this effective model as some um, in this using only a limited number of the of freedom and as an expansion in the interaction through grain. And of course, you have to truncate at some point. But the, what governs the truncation is a coherence length which is not the correlation act that I will show you. And for example, <coughs> that prepared are very well low, very low logs. And as I said, okay, at the end of the day, you get an effective model. What do you do with, with it? It's again, the strongly correlating, interacting, etc. model. But you can, as I will show, so you can use other techniques to attack. Okay, so let's take a simple example. If a 2D Eisenberg model on this plaquetized version of the square lattice, we spin one half, and the anti-ferromagnetic interaction J and J prime. So clearly when you will vary your anterior temperature, if you fix one J to be one, vary J prime, we go from a trivial phase to a nail order to one. So you will have a second order phase transition. And the, the idea is, do you, do you believe that we can describe the phase transition using a single, uh, using plaquettes, and on the plaquette you only keep the lowest singlet and triplet. So using the same thing. So if only look, let's focus only on the right one maybe. So this is just a so can we understand the phase transition only computing two plaquettes? It's a two plaquette in computation. So it's straightforward to do. This is the energy spectrum versus this J prime over J. So of course on two plaquettes you don't see any sign of phase transition because the levels are just adiabatically uh, connected. And the core will, technique will focus on these low level states. So just using this knowledge of eigenstates, you can comp compute effective interactions of the triplets in the plaquette. And if you do that, uh, you, you get the phase transition by measuring some order parameters, so this is just target magnetization. You get a phase transition at the critical value of J prime over And it's simply a superfine insulator phase transition that we, we are now very familiar with, because this boson triplet can condense or not. And if, in fact, if you do a more refined analysis of this, uh, trying to locate more precisely what's done by these people, this is the gap versus J prime over J for various <coughs> core truncation, and you get the next select agreement with the exact of Monte Carlo. So it's even quantitative at this level. So it's a non perturbative one, you can, but you just compute the interaction with this. Uh, so not only can you get the phase transition, but really show you that you can have all the low energy excitations you need if you go to the Eisenberg point. So it's just a 2D in one half square lattice. This is the energy spectrum versus total spin, from the number, just plus one. This is a small system what you can do in a complete full hexagonalization, just to show you the structure. But that this, is, this is a famous tower of state from Anderson. So you have some states here collapsing as one over n, where n is the number of spin. And then you have the spin wave excitation collapsing 1 over n. 
And this is a spectrum of the effective model that we have derived, but on a much bigger system size. But you see that we have all the correct uh, low energy degrees of freedom. So essentially, we haven't lost anything in the low energy. If you describe the name phase, you don't need to keep all the states on the back. You can just truncate and it's pretty normal. OK, so then, of course, we, we wanted to go to uh, other topics. And we, we thought about doing uh, ITC. So it's not the ITC talk, so I will, I will be brief. I will just sketch some experimental facts that I thought were relevant. And, but of course, we could argue for hours or many days or years. But the experimental motivation uh, that was heard yesterday was to learn about superconductivity by destroying it through thermal um, increasing temperature, magnetic field, etc. And there were some evidence, kind of systematic evidence, that antiferromagnetism was in the role. So I'll just flash this, uh, I mean, now all reference by, uh, I mean, you can see the reference, but in the 2001, two. That's been uh, antiferromagnetism was important in vortex storm. For example, this NMR, this is NMR signal versus temperature, where you have the local information outside core, you don't see anything, and inside the core, you have a strong uh, increase of relaxation. But then there was also a big revolution in the STM community, by, mostly by Seamus Davis group, uh, showing directly a real space around the vortex core. So you have a vortex core in, uh, in, in the superconductor. And you can see some charge modulation around in real space. You can also take a very underdog sample, which is not superconducting, and also this is a real space imaging where you can uh, you can see the modulation. So it's a four by four, four a by four a modulation. So charge density wave is also competing with superconductivity. But more recently, all this charge density wave business has been revived too. I mean, there's a nice photo I think that's typical from John Lester. Uh, you, you can, I mean, for years it, uh, it has eluded the normal experiment, but if you just do standard X-ray on ITCO, you can see the spot, and you can see the signal. So it's amazing, even without magnetic field, you can see a charge density wave order. And if you want a more local probe, NMR done in, uh, in Donald, they could also uh, evidence the, the charge ordering around the magic topping of one. So all this physics of charge ordering and spin ordering is, uh, of course, important. Yes, did that you can explain the quantum oscillations. And the last, uh, just to show you that it's still a very active field, again by Seamus Davis, they, now they, they claim that they, they use a T wave superconducting tip to directly inject or remove the upper pair, and you can see the, the modulation in the, which is not this pair of T wave. Okay, so how do we do that with score? So, we, we have used the TJ model, and uh, Asa and uh, Leo at the same time <coughs> did uh, use the Hubbard model, but we could not see our reasons. Essentially, so the model here will be the TJ, and you do the same. On the 2D square axis, you plug it out. You just solve the TJ model on one packet or the bar. So what we have done previously for Heidelberg was not in this sector. So I kept only the lowest signal and three and remove the rest. Now on the packet, we have pair binding. I think we heard also that yesterday. So we can keep the lowest, the, the whole pair, like the top pair on one packet, if you wish, and we can forget about the Fermi. <laughs> so we only keep this bosonic degree of freedom. The reason is that the bosonic model will be much simpler to analyze later. So at the end of the day, what we are doing is simply that. We are doing this real space RG, so going from the TJ to uh, an effective model, but the degree of freedom will be triplet, leaving on the super size and whole pair. And the model, uh, not all the details, but only the main ingredient, ingredients. I think it has some extra motors. But essentially, it is bosonic degrees of freedom. So the triplets or the whole pair, we can walk. They have some chemical potential. And the whole pairs can also repel at short distance. And if you think in each bosonic degree of freedom, it can exhibit a kind of uh, superfluid insulated transition, driven by the ratio of hoping versus uh, chemical potential. And the charge, uh, you know, the charge recursion can lead also to charge ordering, like a beginner that crystallization. So what is nice is that so this model has been derived here from the microscopy, but it, it has very strong resemblance to the so-called projected SO5 that was studied by Asa, Chen Dong, and others, and you can find the word view on this topic. But uh, I mean, here is there is no assumption on anything, you just derive the model. Okay, the benchmark I can, I can skip. And um, so the, 
this charge repulsion will be important because naively, if you look at this magic doping of 1.8, the clear crystal, the most natural one would be 1.8 to so this, this, uh, this uh, unit cell, which is not compatible with the experiment. But if you think in terms of Cooper pair, now it's much more natural to have one Cooper pair every four plaquettes, the same doping. And one Cooper pair every four plaquettes, if you have a vortex score and if you solve your model with a vortex score, so this unit field calculation we did uh, you may see, you may identify this kind of arrangement that is compatible with the STM. So it naturally forms this uh, unit cell. And then if you, if you, I mean, if you now you, you forget about the vortex core, you just want to do the zero temperature phase diagram of this bosonic model. As I said, it's a bosonic model, so it's much more amenable to mean field, but you can also do time free for Monte Carlo. Here it's a bosonic model, so it's a different algorithm than the previous one. You can do a large distance side. And you have very good uh, qualitative agreement. Where, uh, so here, in principle, all the parameters are fixed, but you can just play with the parameters to have uh, some intuition on the phase diagram. So you can find all the pair density waves, preconductors, on the field magnets, etc. So at the end, uh, what we have proposed so in this uh, 2004 paper was a kind of general global phase diagram. In principle, I say the parameters are fixed, but we have argued that maybe the different materials could be slightly different uh, from the microscopic point of view. So that the charge density wave that can occur at this kind of magic doping 1A, etc., would be most, more pronounced in some of the compounds or when you put some defects in homogeneity, maybe locally you could uh, stabilize this uh, charge density. Okay, so that's the about, uh, so back to two D magnets. So <coughs> I want to <coughs> I want to flash this paper, which is maybe the I mean there will be a student session, so maybe we hear from all anecdotes, but it's, I think it's the first paper by uh, Erasberg. <coughs> he was not even I mean, he was really a kid, I think. No? He was not even a PhD student at the time. <laughs> it's not his first paper. It was still, not his first paper. Okay, maybe no, second. Both the paper is But he was also the second paper, no? but he was, he was just a kid, and he was maybe a okay, PhD. And they applied also this technique to some 2D magnets or even 3D. So this is a 2D pyro version of pyroplot, but you can also do a 3D pyroplot. Just to show that it's one of the few techniques that you can attack a 3D model in some control way. But for today, I think this paper in uh, 2003 is amazing. So this is this uh, lattice here, where you have spin one half at each side, and also if you magnetic interaction. And that it will break spontaneously the symmetry, we get some plaquettes version. Some plaquettes will become strong and some weak. And the, the core technique, in a, you just compute, again, two plaquettes. So it's a very simple computation, and you get a lot of the physics. You get TC, I think nobody else has tried to, to get TC. You get the spin yard, you get the, the physics, the low, low, large number of low-lying it's, uh, it's very nice <coughs> in a, Because it's a quantum magnetic obsession, I need to spend some time on the Kagome, because it's a very hot topic in the community of frustrated anti for magnetism. So you just take spin one half on the Kagome lattice, and uh, <coughs> we, we had this collaboration, so with Asa, and also with Marvin Einstein and Ravi Chandra, trying to argue that we, are, we can have a new kind of spin. Okay, so what is frustration? A uh, good definition is that we have many competing states, and uh, of course we can argue for, for, for years of, to, about the one which is going to win. If you start from classical configuration, you have an extensive uh, number of ground state at the classical level. If you think more in terms of quantum, you can start from this resonating valence point, this singlet, nearest neighbor singlet, which are like divers, and again you have an extensive number of divers. So ultimately there should be some order by disorder, but that's a very small energy scale, which is the difficulty that we are facing in many of them. If you think in terms of these divers, for instance, in fact there was another paper by ASA where they, they said okay maybe they could order in some way, so some crystalline way, they could break the lattice transition. And then there were, I mean, these are some of the proposals, but there are, there's a huge literature on this model, on this problem. So if you take this paper, Nikolic Santin, he had proposed this hexagon uh, stripe. Another very, very famous pattern was, because it was found by many different techniques, was a kind of, you have this spin wheel here and the resonating hexagons, but all these are crystals. So you just uh, imagine that the diamonds can order in some way. But on the near top side, uh, it was a breakthrough because it was the first, one of the first attempts of the in 2D. So we had a 
so it's an limit is exponential in the, in the width, so you can people do cylinders that are not that large on the width. It's not so large. But still it's a uh, very good energy, so it's a very competitive uh, technique. And the claim by uh, white co-workers and then Schroeder et al. was that it's a spin equi with a finite gap and it's a Z2 spin equi. Now if you talk to some other people, like if you bias from Monte Carlo, so it's not unbiased uh, because you need some assumption on the bias from wave function, but you do the best you can, apparently, and they, what people claim is that it's a, it could be a gapless spin equi. And if you look at the energy, you also heard this argument yesterday, the energy, of course, it, I mean, can be very close on two different, qualitatively different states. So it's not a, I mean, I don't know if it's a good uh, idea to only focus on energy. Maybe we should try to try something else. So what we have done is, so the, the first, um, the first decoupling that was natural so a long time ago, this was in 2004, was to use this triangular coupling and do the core calculation. But if you solve, I think the defects also, but if you solve just a single triangle, it's very simple, but you get four states. So the spin one half and the two spin one half, which is just chiral. So the model that you will write down, the effective model will be a kind of spin orbital model. You know what, like a Google constant, you're familiar with this kind of model. And they are very difficult to analyze. So what we did just was numerics, but it was not possible to go to very much bigger size. Actually, you just reach 48 sides that you can also do on the Heisenberg now. But, okay, we argue that it was compatible at least with the finite spin gap that was difficult to, to understand the, the low energy. So the idea that uh, came up with uh, Assam and the uh, worker was to use this, uh, of course, because we were in Italy, it's very natural to use this Magan David, and it's very natural also in the Kagome. If you saw this uh, star of David, it has two degenerate drop states, so just like, again, a chirality. So if you do like a pseudo spin, of course, it has many other states, but you will truncate them away. <coughs> so you will work with this pseudo spin, and now the goal is to compute the effective interactions. If you do, if you do perturbation theory, was done by in this paper, you will find some ordering of this pseudo spin. So essentially, you will. The, the point of this talk also maybe, yeah, yesterday we heard this remark by Steve Kilton, that if you want some control approximation, you could also do a kind of plaquetized version. You can reduce some bonds and uh, you have very, you have this magnet and then you have very weak bonds and then it will be very controlled perturbation. But of course the idea here, we need a non-perturbative tool to go to the isotropic limit, but still I will argue we can have a control calculation. So what is the control calculation? If you do the range two, meaning you solve two of these two stars, you can do the effective interaction, we find ordering, which is not, which is not compatible with any other reader. Great that is symmetry, you would have this kind of crystal. But anyway, I mean it's controlled because you can estimate the, uh, the, the next term, the term negative, so maybe the range three. So range three is just three stars like this with open bar evolution, so you just solve this guy, compute the effective interaction, the amplitude of these terms, and using this effective model at, a, at this range, we can estimate energy because I, I don't like energy, but at some point we have to compare to the techniques. What we have done is that using this effective model, we could argue by comparing energies to gamma D on small clusters that the, the truncation at this range is safe. Safe enough to some level to estimate 0.4% of course. So we say it was convergent. And now if it's convergent, we can use this renormalized Hamiltonian on a much bigger system. So this is numerics of 27 stars. So this is a huge Latin. And the spectrum is very peculiar. So this is a spectrum versus uh, quantum numbers, space group, and the momentum, etc. And maybe you can see all the symbols, the cross system, but all the levels are doubly degenerate. Almost. We are on finite system, we cannot break symmetry, but they are almost doubly degenerate. So this is a clear signature, if you look at the quantum numbers, of a chiral symmetry breaking. You break the reflection symmetry. So this is why we dubbed this uh, Phase of P6, P6, this is just a graphical representation of the crystallographic proof. This is just a state that doesn't break any translation, not only reflection. Still consistent with uh, the source of the entropy? No, but no. Okay, okay. The entanglement entropy in the analogy, I think, you know, there was all 
told you about mini major tangle state, etc. So I've got the impression that they very often found C2 spin liquid, even though in some cases now we know it, they were wrong. So I, I don't criticize the Kagome results, but I think we have to be careful. It seems that they are not biased to this C2 spin liquid, and I think it's okay. But no, in principle, the crystal on the contrary should be positive, that it's very hard, I think. Well, uh, at zero for them. And what I said about having a, an effective model that you can attack with other techniques here is very nice because the effective model in this two spin language, I should be married, but essentially it's a model like this on the triangular lattice. And you can do a mean field. The parameters are fixed in principle, huh? so they are somewhere. But to understand the competition, you can do a mean field. And then you see that indeed, I mean, mean field confirms that the carbonation curve would be in this P6 speed liquid phase, but very close to the fully polarized that was found in perturbation or range 2. And very close also to one of the proposed states in the literature, this hexagonal DBC. So, as we also heard yesterday, we should understand, we know there is competition. So we know the phases are very close. So it would be nice to also have a model where you can understand where they are, where they are and how we can write, for instance, using J2, we discussed in the paper, how we can, we can try to write the... the When you say it's a spin liquid, this is this state doesn't have any long range entanglement. Is that right? Yes. So it's not a spin liquid in the sense of decomposing excitation. No, it was just a spin liquid in the sense of translation environment. Okay. Well, no, that's not. Quite no, it has. It's an object. It's a zero. What? Yeah, it's a zero. Yeah. 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 It means uh, broken chirality. No, no, that's that's probably not non spin chirality. What? Spatial curve. Spatial curve. But it's, or, it's an RPP. It's a superposition of timers everywhere. No, but it's, no, but it's not long range. It's not long range. It's a trend. 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 It's Okay, so it is the same. Yes, yes. Okay. They have not identified the product yet. What? No, I don't think we have. We did measure the entanglement. Yeah. 
is again an interactive model. But as I, as I have shown, you can study with um, many of the techniques, especially when it's a bosonic one, you can attack it easily with midfield, two filler, are provided for Monte Carlo, etc. And it's very systematic, so we, of course, we, we have tried uh, many other models where uh, into the frustration where we don't have that many techniques. And some quick perspectives, also the P600, I think it's very, it would be very important. <coughs> you know there are debates about this compound. So one, one uh, attempt would be to, because TP Diamagi has been successful somehow at the Kagome, would be to check this order, which is not trivial, in fact, to be there. So we have to collaborate and train to let people measure that. And about the dot not insulated, maybe I want to answer this paper by Berg, maybe this is a left. Because we have neglected the Fermion completely, so maybe it's okay for the zero temperature phase diagram, but if you want to connect the experiment, transport, etc., we need to put back the Fermion. So maybe there is a way to have a sign problem free for to Monte Carlo by having some free Fermion coupled to the relevant bosonic excitation. And of course, many more than you have. So thanks, and uh, once again, Madden Top. Yeah. <laughs> 
speak. It's a good state for self-hating Jews. That's it, my dear David.